Hello, and welcome to the InfoQ podcast. I'm Charles Humble, and this week I'm talking to Stephen Wolfram. Stephen is the creator of Mathematica, Wolfram Alpha, and the Wolfram Language. He's the author of a number of books, including A New Kind of Science, and is the founder and CEO of Wolfram Research. Stephen, welcome to the InfoQ podcast. Hi. So I was really keen to talk to you about the Wolfram Language, because I think it's rather unusual and fascinating. And I thought perhaps we should start by talking about its origins and specifically SMP, the Symbolic Manipulation Program, which you worked on along with Chris Cole at Caltech in the late 1970s. What was the main goal for that language? Well, gosh, you're asking story of my life here. <laughs> Rough picture. I grew up in the UK. I started off being very enthusiastic about physics and started doing physics when I was a kind of early to mid teenager. One of the bad features of doing physics is that you have to do all these kind of complicated mathematical calculations, which I wasn't very keen on doing as a human. I said, it's really boring. It's mechanical. It should be automatable. So I started using computers to do that kind of thing. Then Around 1979, I kind of had sort of become the world's largest user, I think, of the sort of research systems that have been built to do kind of mathematical computation by computer and was kind of like, well, am I going to get somebody else to build the thing that should be built or am I going to do it myself? And so I, after a little bit of, oh, can I get other people to do it? It's like, if you really want it done, you've got to do it yourself. This was late 1979. I kind of said, well, okay, if I want to build a general system that can do all the kinds of computation that will be relevant in the difficult application area of math, but also in lots of other areas, what should that system be based on? And so I was pretty aware of theoretical computer science and kind of mathematical logic and so on. But you know, I was kind of looking back at, okay, we're doing this computing thing. We want to do it in as high level way as possible. How should we do that? And were there other languages that you looked to for inspiration? The languages are probably the closest to being inspiration is probably Lisp and APL. But both of those had been different ways, kind of had sort of origins in mathematical logic ideas, not necessarily as academically precisely as they might have done, but they were at least inspired by those ideas. So I got interested in understanding things from that point of view. In fact, it just so happens in the history is smaller than you think that December 7th of 1920 is a key date in the history of symbolic computation because it's the day that Moses Schoenfinkel introduced combinators. All right. And combinators today are things that people think, oh, that's this obscure curiosity, nobody cares, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I've recently been tracing the history. The history is quite fascinating. And the way that combinators ended up leading to lambda calculus and to lots of other kinds of things. And although, although combinators themselves are more pure and extreme than even we have managed to reach today, there's probably five or six different elements of kind of making everything abstract and symbolic that combinators did. And we've done essentially all but one of them now today. And I think that my original inspiration for what I did was kind of the things that have been done in mathematical logic. I did not understand the history, actually, as clearly then as it happens today, because I've been studying things for this centenary. But my other meta idea was, you know, I was used to doing physics and natural science. Kind of the, the main picture of what you do is there are certain phenomena in the world. Your goal is to kind of drill down and find out what are the primitive elements that lie underneath those phenomena. And that was kind of what I saw myself in doing in that kind of language design. And so how does that relate to what you were doing with SMP? You know, a symbolic language that is really based on transformation rules for patterns. That's what it does. So when you define a function in the modern Wolfram language syntax, which is better than the SMP syntax, it's, you know, f of x blank x underscore colon equals whatever the function does. What does that actually mean? That means whenever you see an expression that is the form f of anything, the blank, named x, transform it to this right-hand side. So that means that the left-hand side can have anything you want on it. It could be f of the list x blank x blank, which means it's just going to match pairs of identical elements. Or we could define that. We could also define you know f of 1, 2 as something different. It's just saying there are these patterns and you make transformations for these patterns. And so in SMP, I tried out a bunch of kind of, in a sense, radical pattern matching ideas for sort of how to do symbolic computation. And some of them worked really well. Some of them didn't work so well. And it was kind of a great experience in a sense. I mean, you know, it had lots of users and things and a company and all that kind of stuff. But in addition to that, it was my first kind of really big software project, the design was a fascinating data point for me because I got to make this design, see what happened, you know, five years later or more, and see which things people understood, which things they did not understand. And you know, this core idea of transformation rules for symbolic expressions, fantastic idea, worked great. Some details, 
completely crazy <laughs> and got changed. And, you know, you read the documentation people write for the language you created, you know, five years later, and there are things where it's like, nobody understands this. Right, yes. And it's like, that was a design mistake. <laughs> yes. And so, in a sense, when I came to start designing Wolfram Language in 1986, I had the tremendous advantage of having tried a bunch of things that were, in a sense, even more radical. I mean, it's kind of funny. There are a few things that I did, like things we call associations of Wolfram Language, just mappings, I mean, other people call them associative arrays, dictionaries, whatever else. I had those things in SMP in a very generalized way, and they were too generalized in SMP, and that kind of put me off having those things for probably 25 years afterwards. But, you know, the conception, the chassis, the framework, it's all about transformation rules for symbolic expressions. The thing that has been a huge surprise over the last 40 years is all the different kinds of things that you can represent in that form and kind of what's emerged and kind of the, the story of the modern Wolfram language is a kind of a branch in the world of how you get computers to do things that's really pretty different from what people have traditionally done with programming languages and so on. And it's all sort of built on top of this symbolic computation idea, but it goes off in a very different direction in terms of using that sort of symbolic representation to describe the world, so to speak, and to describe all the kinds of things you might want to compute about or think about computationally, so to speak. So you mentioned Lisp and APL as a couple of influences. Did you also look at some of the algebraic systems, things like MATLAB and Formula Algol, for instance? Well, yeah. I mean, so in terms of Maxima, Reduce, Schoonship, all those kinds of things, you know, I knew them well. I used them. I was a big user of those things. They were very Algol-like. Well, Schoonship was different. Schoonship, it's like you've got three systems. One of them is written in Lisp. One of them is written in, well, there was another one called Ashmadai. It was written in Fortran. And one of them was written in CDC 6000 series assembly language. Okay. And so the question is, of the three authors of those things, which one subsequently won a Nobel Prize? And the answer is the guy who wrote in CDC 6000 <laughs> assembly language. One of the things that I think is really interesting when you look back at sort of relatively early languages is how different the ergonomics are to modern design. I was a consultant at Bell Labs for a while back in the early 1980s, and so I knew people like Dennis Ritchie and so on. And he was like, oh, it's really nice that in SMP you have these short command names. And it turns out that was one of the very bad ideas in SMP was short command names. But at the time, the ergonomics was different because your average user of SMP didn't know how to type. Right, yes. And so, you know, at least not type, I don't know, what would you say these days? Touch type, it used to be called. I don't know what it's called these days. I think it's just type these days. Yes, I think it probably is. And so it really made a difference that somebody would be able to type just three letters, you know, punch them out. And, you know, ideas like command completion didn't exist at the time. And so those aspects of ergonomics were different. It was more at the level above the kind of symbolic computation level, at the level of kind of how to think about mathematical computation, those systems probably more relevant. In terms of language design, I don't think they were terribly, that was not my primary source of inspiration. I mean, you know, the fact that, yes, there is still a go-to in Wolfram Language in 2020, and most people don't use it. We have a lot of celebrity users, and one, you know, occasionally I get to see their code, and there was a chap called John Nash who was very famous in game theory and so on, and he was a user of ours, and I happened to see some code he wrote, and he was the only person whose code was absolutely threaded with go-tos. Really? <laughs> Extraordinary. I've never seen that any other place. Do you think that having essentially mathematical computation as an absolute cornerstone, something you have to hit in terms of the design, had an impact on SMP and maybe subsequently Wolfram Language as well? That's a very high bar because it's a really complicated area. And things like, you know, you have to be able to represent things symbolically. Well, yes, you have mathematical formulas. Later on, you know, there's this whole string of things. It was like, first there was that. Then there was we represent graphics symbolically. Then there was we represent user interfaces symbolically. Then there was, you represent all kinds of, well, just a whole string of other things, whether it's now sort of cloud deployment symbolically, whether it's now representing entities in the world, like, you know, New York City or something symbolically, whether it's representing, you know, all these kinds of things. And what's happened over the years is that I've discovered, and I don't know whether it's obvious this should be the case, that this core idea of symbolic expressions and transformation rules for symbolic expressions, it really covers all these things. And it covers them in a very actually usable way. It's not saying, let's have a theory of the world, and that theory of the world is predicate logic, for example, and then saying, okay, everything's got to follow predicate logic. This is a much more general idea than that. It doesn't work to just use predicate logic. That's a pretty poor model of sort of representing knowledge about the world. 
So why do you think this idea that everything can be represented as a symbolic expression works? Possibly that works because of the way that we humans think about things. That is part of what I've spent my life doing is studying kind of computation in the wild. You take a small program, you see what it does. Big discovery from the early 80s was, you know, even these very tiny programs do really complicated things. And the question then is, they do really complicated things, but are they things we care about? And the answer is, it depends whether our technology has made us want to care about that thing. You know, do we need a random number generator? Do we need a thing that does this kind of compression? Unless we have the idea of random number generation, the idea of compression, we don't care about those things. I see kind of the role of language design as being this bridge between what is computationally possible and what we humans think about. I find that fascinating because you're almost getting into linguistic theory. You're almost getting into kind of linguistic relativity, which is this idea that you can only express ideas that you have words for. Yes. And that's very different from how computer language designers typically think about language design. For me, the fact that the symbolic representation of the world works as a way to build up a computational language is probably not unrelated to the fact that we humans think about things in sort of symbolic terms. And I think that there are things, I mean, from my point of view, our language, you know, the analogy is probably more like something like the invention of mathematical notation than it is the construction of early programming languages. And the big thing, which you know, is certainly an encouragement to me in terms of spending my life building up this computational language is, you know, if you look at the history of sort of mathematical notation, it's like 400 years old. Before that time, you wanted to explain math to somebody, you'd be trying to describe things in words, and it wasn't very streamlined, wasn't very efficient. Then mathematical notation, you know, plus signs, equal signs, things like that got invented. And suddenly math could take off and we got algebra and calculus. And then we got all the mathematical sciences and so on developing. You know, as far as I'm concerned, the goal of what we're trying to do is to enable that same kind of computational language to exist as the mathematical language that came into existence maybe 400 years ago, and to use that to enable kind of computational X for all X. That's the goal, and to provide people a vehicle for thinking about things computationally with the fantastic assist that, oh, your computer can do it too, so to speak, which wasn't a thing back in the day of mathematical notation. So I think the goals have been very different. And it's almost like, well, what category of thing are you making? Well, we're kind of a category of one, which always has problems. I mean, it's intellectually interesting, but it always, it's like, well, what is it like? Is it like this programming language or that programming language? Well, no, not really, because its goals are very different. Can you give me some concrete examples of those goals? We have to have a way to represent, I don't know, information about movies and things. Or we have to have a way as well to represent packets going on a network and things like this. And having these kind of representations of things in the world, so to speak, and making those representations sort of interoperable, that's, well, it's a lot of work, but that's kind of what we've tried to do. And tried to really incorporate into the language knowledge of the world, so to speak. I mean, I think that the concept is just as back when I started using computers, it was just a computer with machine code. Later on, it got, you know, primitive languages, and then it got operating systems, and it got networking, then it got some UI. It doesn't yet have sort of built-in computational intelligence. Our goal is to use the language that I've just spent the last 40 years building and allow that to become the source of take-for-granted computational intelligence that people can expect to see when they use computers and expect to have kind of a way of interacting with their computers that is something which is kind of a bridge between their way of thinking and what computers are in principle capable of. And that's the concept. And the challenge, well, the practicalities of, oh, you know, there's this big language and it's all coherently designed and it runs in the cloud and it runs on the desktop and it runs on servers, all those kinds of things. Those are the hard work of the engineering around kind of what is ultimately an intellectual idea about build this full-scale computational language that can represent the world computationally and allow people to think about it computationally. And I think you correctly identified sort of a core issue there is what is the ultimate representation of things? And the answer is, it's actually exactly the same thing as the kind of core ideas of mathematical logic going back about 100 years that have not tended to be captured in the same way and at least in practical languages and so on.
we've been forced to do that because we're trying to represent a much broader range of things in the world. We're not just saying, oh, it's an array, it's a structure, it's a this, it's a that. It's like, it's got to represent a chemical, it's got to represent a molecule, it's got to have a way of doing that, it's got to have a way of doing that in a way that it can be computed with. And as part of doing that, with the Wolfram language, you have an infinite evaluation system. Can you briefly describe what that means and how that works? You define a function, which is basically setting up a transformation rule for a pattern for symbolic expressions. So that pattern, you know, for example, you say, well, how do you deal with sort of object-oriented stuff? Well, you don't really have to, because what you're doing is you're saying f of, and then the thing that's inside that f is an arbitrary pattern. So if inside the f it wants to be dealing with g of something or other and h of something or other, that's just what you write. You don't have to say, oh, there's this type, and now we're going to get that from somewhere else. It's just right there in the symbolic expression that you're making a transformation for. And then how does the transformation itself work? So what it's doing is it's just saying it goes along and it's evaluating things, and it sees f of g of whatever, and it says, okay, I know a rule for that. Let me apply that rule. People would expect it to do that infinitely for functions. It also does that infinitely for variables. I am always hoping nobody defines global variables, but they can. In the session-based, you can use Wolfram language as a session-based thing in notebooks, or you can use it as an API. If it's an API, then whatever global thing you define is gone by the time the API is finished executing. So that's less dangerous. But yes, you know, you can define the variable x. If you say x equals x plus 1, it will say recursion error. It will loop for a while. And then, so one of the things that's interesting about language design is you might say, oh my gosh, the fact that x equals x plus one blows up would kill everything. The fact that you can make circular definitions and with infinite evaluation, they'll blow up. You might say, oh my gosh, it'll kill everything. People will be confused. They are not. You know, those are bugs, basically. They're simple bugs. And it's one of the complicated judgment calls of language design. My theory is the only evaluator that is absolutely perfect and has no weird behavior in any case is an evaluator that does absolutely nothing. In other words, as soon as it does something, there's going to be something that you might consider to be a weird case, so to speak. And what's really interesting in language design is to lead people to not rub their noses against the weird cases, to lead them to do the things which are actually going to work and are actually going to be well-defined and are actually going to be efficient and so on. And I think that's part of the sort of the art of language design is to do that. So I'll tell you something about evaluation that really brings us right up to the minute. So in SMP, I actually tried to define the way that the evaluation front would go. So for example, let's say you define a Fibonacci function. So you're saying f of n is f of n minus 1, or you know, in Wolfram language, it will be f of n blank colon equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2, f of 1 equals f of 2 equals 1. Okay, that's the Wolfram language way of defining that. And now the question is, how does that get evaluated? So one thing you can do is a depth-first recursion through the Fibonacci tree. So in other words, you say f of 10 goes to f of 9, which then goes to f of 8, f of 7, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the only way you could do it. You could say, by the time you've got f of 10 goes to f of 9 plus f of 8, then f of 9 goes to 8 plus 7, f of 8 goes to 7 plus 6. Now you've got two f of 7s. You could say, hey, wait a minute, let me combine those before I go on doing the evaluation. So that's more of a kind of breadth-first evaluation strategy than a depth-first one. Okay. In SMP, I parameterized that. I had these ways of attributes for functions that would parameterize their recursive evaluation. And it was one of the failures of the design of SMP because nobody understood it. I mean, it was a way of parameterizing essentially the evaluation front. Now, okay, so now we come, you know, 40 years later, and here I am working on fundamental theory of physics. And turns out that, again, somewhat to my embarrassment, I realized that the core idea that's needed for the fundamental theory of physics is an idea about symbolic expressions. But unlike the ones that we use in Wolfram language, where all the pieces mean something, they have definite, you know, this means a chemical, that means addition, that means whatever. The ones that occur in our theory of physics are meaningless. They are purely the infrastructure of symbolic expressions. You know, so in a sense, the universe space consists of a symbolic expression with 10 to the 400 elements. So then what happens, and it's really a very beautiful and amazing thing, is that the transformation rules for symbolic expressions in the space, the, this big hypergraph that represents space in the universe, you can do these transformations, you just define a bunch of transformations, you can do them sort of anywhere, assuming that the inputs are available for them. 
So in other words, there's this causal graph that says, what is the chain of causality that says, is, are the inputs ready or not? If the inputs are ready, then you can do that evaluation. So you have all these different evaluations happening in parallel. And I'm explaining this in very computery terms. I mean, this is not how I got to this, nor how you'd see it explained for your average physicist, so to speak. But what it is, is something where you have this kind of giant distributed symbolic computation system. And then the big question is, what's the ordering in which those updates happen? And it turns out there's a property that's related to the confluence property for term rewriting systems. That property ends up giving one special relativity and general relativity. But that property implies that essentially the reference frames of special relativity correspond to different evaluation fronts in the universe. So in other words, depending on what reference frame you're in, you're making different choices about what order you say that these different possible evaluations that could have happened are in. So it's actually very much back to the ideas that I had in SMP that were this attempt to parameterize the evaluation front now becomes the story of reference frames in physics. That's absolutely astonishing. That evaluation front stuff was incomprehensible in SMP, even to me, to be honest. But now what is really interesting is by using the last hundred years of physics and by using all the things we know about relativity and general relativity and so on, we actually have a language to talk about this idea of reference frames and things about metrics and all that kind of thing and event horizons and all those kinds of things. And it looks like we can use those ideas to re-import this notion of evaluation fronts back into language design and basically give us a new way to think about how to do distributed computing. I'm a bit lost there, to be honest. How do reference frames help with the problems of distributed computing? In a sense, you're thinking about, oh, I'm programming in such and such a reference frame. That means that I'm expecting the update events to happen in a certain ordering as opposed to being in some other reference frame where it happens in different ordering. So what's going on there, and I don't know if this will completely work, but we'll see whether we're in the right century to do this. But the question is, you know, distributed computing has been difficult to wrap one's head around how to program in. So the question is, can we now use the intellectual development that's happened in physics to give us essentially a language and a way of thinking about how to do that? So this is a typical thing in language design. That is, the things that I could do in SMP There were lots of limitations, particularly in the area of functional programming. There were lots of things which I could see were theoretically doable and which I could implement, but which people wouldn't understand, like the fold operation, for example. That operation, I could put it into SMP in 1980 and nobody would understand it. Well, we had it in SMP. We've had it from the beginning in Wolfram Language. But today, that's something that, because of sort of ambient understanding of functional programming, one is at the point where that's something, oh, yeah, one can understand that. And what I've seen in functional programming, for example, is that we've gradually introduced more and more elaborate kinds of constructs that make use of more and more of these kind of higher order function ideas. And it's kind of an interesting thing because when one is doing language design, what one is trying to do is leverage what people already understand to let them do things that they can then get a computer to sort of power a system with. So the question is, what do they already understand? And the biggest thing they already understand, which is something that has not been leveraged in programming languages, is natural language. People know 50,000 words. They know a bunch of concepts. They know things about how the world works. That's something that, were it not for natural language, there is no way we could build our computational language. Right, even down to the level of, for instance, naming a function. I consider it the minimal version of poetry. How do you name a function? You have to name a function so that people will use their knowledge of natural language to have the right idea about how the function works. And maybe you get two words, maybe you get three for your micro poem, so to speak, about what the function does. Sometimes these things come easily. Sometimes they take disgustingly long time. I mean, there are functions that we haven't had because we don't know a name for them. And it's not useful. There's a lump of functionality that you kind of want to put in But in a sense, there's no point in putting it in. If they see that name in a piece of computational language, they see the name and it's like, I don't know what that is. You might as well write out an idiom in terms of things they do understand. There's no point in naming it. But if you do have a name for it, it's very worthwhile to have that be a built-in function in the language because then when somebody sees that and they see it in a piece of code, they're like, oh, I get what that's doing. I have a sort of cognitive picture of what's going on there. 
So it's this really kind of interesting interplay between using what people already know, of which natural language is probably the biggest piece, knowledge of how the world works is another piece, and maybe 20th century physics is another piece that we haven't really had a chance to make use of yet. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the natural language aspects, because I think the interplay between natural language and the programming language and the Wolfram language is one of its more unusual aspects. And I was wondering why it isn't purely a natural language system. I built Wolfram language for a long time. And Mathematica, you know, which is basically the same story, but intended for people doing mathematical kinds of things. Then back in the early 2000s, I started building Wolfram Alpha. And the question was, could we use the same kind of design purity that we had used for the Wolfram language for Wolfram Alpha? So Wolfram Alpha was intended to be a, anybody walks up to it, you ask it some random question in natural language, it gives you an answer. Okay. I very quickly decided that it was kind of an interesting experience for me that I would just throw away everything I knew about language design and designing Wolfram Alpha. Because in language design, everything was about, you know, let's make it perfect, let's make it all unified, let's make it completely coherent, let's do all the corner cases correctly. And in Wolfram Alpha, it was, you type in a random piece of natural language, it should do what you mean. If 50 cent is the name of a wrapper, but 51 cent is currency, then so be it. You know, in other words, just do what people expect. Natural language has evolved historically, and it's full of inconsistencies and completely crazy things. Even the kind of pseudo-natural language that includes some technical kinds of things has those kinds of imperfections. But so in building Wolfram Alpha, it's a very interesting experience because it was just a completely different design methodology. I mean, before Wolfram Alpha, I'd always been suspicious of heuristics of, oh, let's do this for this case, but that for that case. And it's all a bit fuzzy. But Wolfram Alpha, its natural language understanding system is kind of a giant, at some level, it's all heuristics all the way down. The thing that was surprising about Wolfram Alpha natural language understanding system was that people had tried to build natural language understanding systems for a long time and never been very successful at it. And I tried to sort of use methods from computational linguistics, found them pretty useless. What I realized was the killer thing that we had that people hadn't had before is we had a target for the natural language. That is, we were just converting it to our symbolic language. And we had a lot of built-in knowledge about the world. And those two things were what allowed us to actually make a successful, broad natural language understanding system. I wouldn't have expected that. In the abstract, it was like, it's kind of an AI-ish problem that's sort of general AI. It's not something that depends on having already built this elaborate computational language and having knowledge of the world, so to speak. Those wouldn't have been the things that would first come to mind in doing natural language understanding. But anyway, so we built up Wolfram Alpha, and I thought for a long time, oh, there's a separate story from Wolfram language, two different branches. And then I realized, what would happen if we brought these two things together? Some things are really well explained in natural language and really pretty awkward to explain in computational language. Like if you want New York City, you know you can just type in NYC. Now, that's heuristic because, you know, if you type NY, is that supposed to be New York, New York State? You know, what is it? So what we realized is you just type control equals NY, and it will bring up this thing that basically says, uh, you know, I think it probably defaults to New York City. I don't know. I'd have to try it to find out. But then when you press OK, more or less, what it's doing is it's turning that into symbolic entity that is New York City, New York, United States, so to speak. So in other words, we're taking a fragment of natural language and we're using that, we're embedding it in this program. Natural language is just the input method, but then it becomes a precise symbolic entity, which we can then deal with. I wasn't expecting that. That turned out to be really super powerful. So given that, why not go all the way and use natural language as the way to communicate with your computer and tell it what to do? Okay, here's what we found. When you're dealing with short utterances, that works just fine. As soon as it gets more complicated, it just falls apart completely. And so I saw that very explicitly and rather nicely. I wrote this little book called Elementary Introduction to Wolfram Language, which was originally intended for kids, although it turns out that seems to be a good thing for lots of adults too. But in writing that book, I did something which almost was against my principles, which is to have you know exercises in the book, right? And so the exercises are basically say things like, write a program that does this. Okay, so in the early part of the book, the exercise is written in natural language. It's saying, you know, write a program that does this. In the early part of the book, it was like easy to write the exercises. By the time I was getting later in the book, it was like, this is pretty weird. You know, to specify what this program should be in natural language, I'm writing some bizarre piece of legalese, basically, to say what I want. This is not working. 
oh, that's good, because that's what I just spent my life building, was a computational language to actually be able to express these kinds of ideas in a way that you could build a giant tower that involves millions of lines of code, so to speak, rather than just the short utterance. So the thing that I found the most powerful, again, I wasn't expecting this, is this mixture of the embedded natural language short utterances that turn into a precise symbolic representation that then get embedded in big pieces of code that are represented in terms of computational language. Now, one of the big things that I also have noticed is what ambient knowledge of computation is there and how can one leverage that in building a computational language? And so one of the things we've been working towards is computational contracts where because we now have a computational language that can express things about the world, instead of writing legalese, we can write computational language because we can actually express things, you know, if the price of gold is bigger than this and it was raining yesterday and wherever, and this IoT sensor says this, then do this type thing. Or if this machine learning image identification thing says the banana is ripe, then, you know, do whatever. And so computational contracts are one of those sort of inexorable things that will eventually be widely used. And as people get familiar with reading those things, there'll be a whole nother level of what's possible to do in computational language, because there'll be a whole nother set of things that people are routinely exposed to and routinely understand. For me, it's very interesting, this process of what people ambiently understand. I mean, if you go back 100 years and you talk about universal computation, nobody would understand it. It wasn't a concept. If you explain it to kids now, it's like, oh, you can program it. You don't have to change computers to change what it does. It's commonplace. Everybody ambiently understands that. Same thing with graphs and hyperlinks on the web. There's a certain degree of built-in understanding of what a graph is that you get from having followed a bunch of hyperlinks on the web. And it's how one leverages these kinds of things that are part of a sort of common experience. That's part of the story of doing language design. I'm curious about how you think about language and library and data. So in the Wolfram language, there seems to be much less of a distinction between the three. So you might be working with a function from the function repository and pulling in data from the Wolfram cloud. And there's a sort of blurring of the boundaries, which seems to be part of the nature of the Wolfram language. Do you think that's kind of intrinsic to the nature of symbolic language? Well, it's part of the, it's the story of computational language, because what we've done is in Wolfram language, there is a built-in, well-designed, integrated representation of images, videos, audio, graphs, optimization problems, geographic data, all these kinds of things. Those are built-in features of the language, which have been the story of my life to try and design in a coherent way. And there are you know, 6,000 built-in functions that represent all these different kinds of things in the world. And that's the main thing people use. Now, we recently introduced this function repository, which is a way of sort of adding functionality on top of that. Here's what's interesting about that. And again, I hadn't really expected in terms of design, okay? So with libraries, the typical programming language, different story from computational language, the typical programming language, it's a small core programming language, and then there's layers and layers of libraries that people use. And there's often a lot of, you know, oh my gosh, I've got an incompatible set of libraries. Oh, this blah, 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 blah. It's all a bit complicated. And there's no guarantee that there's any coherence of design between these different pieces of libraries. So the question is, given that we have this vastly higher level platform to start with, where we have a built-in representation of, let's say, images or something, what can one then do? And what I realized is, if you look at a lot of libraries out there, you'll find, well, there's this one or two really important function in that library that does something really cool. And then there's 50 support functions that deal with the fact that, oh, there isn't a standard representation of audio and you have to deal with audio import and you have to do this and you have to do that and the other. So I realized that we're in a different situation because the vast majority of what people do is going to be pure within the Wolfram language. And, you know, if I did my job correctly, the thing that you do when you program some random microcontroller with the whole system for doing microcontroller programming in Wolfram language, that's going to be compatible with the things that we do in machine learning, for example. It's something where if I did my job correctly, these are all coherently designed and you can take, you know, the machine learning output and feed it into this other thing and you can use machine learning to do this or that thing. And you can feed into your machine learning thing this weird piece of data that's an audio combined with a this combined with a that because all these things have been coherently designed. It's a huge amount of effort to do that coherent design. Given that you've done that, then that one key function that you would have put in this big library is just one function. 
and you just have to build it on top of this tall platform of other kinds of things. So it's a different experience in terms of the library story. Now, the function repository is quite new and interesting story. I mean, we had a precursor of it back in 1989 and it didn't work very well. And it didn't work well because it wasn't well collimated. In other words, it was like, well, just put in anything. You know, Wolfram language is incredibly extensible. So when people write all kinds of things. You can redefine the plus operation. You can do whatever you want. And it turns out what works much better is to say, there is this huge platform. You want to add this one particular piece of functionality. It's going to stick its neck out as one or two functions. Just put it in the function repository. It has a standardized way of being documented and so on, a standardized way of being used. Now, a thing we haven't yet seen that's going to be an interesting piece of language design is the following track. So it's like these different levels of coherence. We see it with data, for example. You know, you have a piece of data, it's in a spreadsheet, you can kind of read it in. Then the question is, how do you make that data computable? How do you take those things which actually represent cities in spreadsheet and make them actual canonical entities that you can do things with? Actually, a new part of that story, if you follow the leading edge of Excel development, you'll see that Microsoft is integrating a bunch of our stuff for doing those kinds of things in Excel as a built-in feature there. That's very cool. I didn't know that. It's a coming attraction. It's out there for test users, but it's not yet fully being talked about. But it's kind of a Wolfram language play inside Excel. How does using Wolfram inside of Excel compare to, say, what you can do with Siri and Alexa? Siri and Alexa use our natural language understanding system to do, but they're not exposing the actual sort of something where you're actually getting the symbolic entities. But that's something you can do in something like a spreadsheet environment. So as you, as it were, going to go up the chain and try and make this data more and more computable, what does that look like? For us, it's really a painful thing because I sort of identified at some point these 10 stages of making data computable. And the trouble is that at each stage, there's just a lot more work to do. So for example, when we put data into Wolfram Alpha, let's say we're putting in data on mountains or lakes or something. Typical way somebody will access it in Wolfram Alpha is say, I want to know about Mount such and such. Okay, great. If we have data on mounts such and such, we're all good. Mm -hmm. But if we want to put data on mountains into Wolfram language, we perfectly well know that the use case is somebody's going to write a program that looks at mountain entities, and they're going to say some geo region defined by some polygon, you know, give me all the mountains inside this polygon. Okay, and the level of curation and quality of the data to support that has to be much higher than just I've got a mountain, it's got a name, tell me about it. And so what we find, and this is sort of an interesting design process, is as we get it to the point where it is part of our core permanent language, it takes a lot more work to do that. And so it's a continuing issue, I think about it quite a bit, of how do we get something where we can get the, oh, it's a simple thing, and we can get it done quickly in a lightweight way, versus how do we have something which is sort of a core permanent feature of the language? I mean, one feature of our language, which I'm quite proud of, is you can take a piece of Wolfram language code that was written in 1988, and it will run today with exceptionally high probability. That's actually fairly remarkable. I mean, it's a constant debate in, for language designers about how much backwards compatibility to maintain. And, you know, it's not a thing that happens accidentally. Right. In this physics project I've been doing, I did a lot of the early work on that in the early 1990s. And I have the notebooks I wrote. In fact, they're even up on the web now. And it's really cool. You just read them in and they run. And how was that achieved? Partly it was achieved by not making too many mistakes. And the fact that I'd built a language before allowed me to have already made a bunch of the mistakes I might have made. But the other thing, which is an interesting language design process, is the following thing. So let's say you have an area which you think is kind of cruddy, and you think it was kind of, eh, we didn't do it quite right. So then what do you do about it? So what I've learned over the years is that the thing to do is the following. Just figure out what the correct design is. Figure out where you're going. And then you might say, oh, my God, we'll never be able to get there. You know, we've got this other thing that works this way. We'll never be able to get to this new design. It takes some cleverness, but it turns out you can essentially always find a bridge. Can you give me an example where you've done that? I'll give you an example of a design mistake. Okay. The function set that assigns, you know, x equals 7 is set x comma 7, right? You can write it as x equals 7. The fact that we used up the word set to represent that was a mistake. In other words, because nobody will ever type it, people always just type an equal sign. You might as well call that, you know, assign value to variable, and nobody would know the difference, so to speak. And that was a place where, you know, we sort of used up a good word. And so in modern times, when we're doing design, where we're not quite sure, where we have a concept, we think it might be generalizable, 
but we're not sure it's generalizable yet. Don't use the general word yet, use some compound thing. And maybe at some point in the future, there will be a general case that is just the uncompounded word, so to speak. And, you know, I don't know, let's say it was audio annotate. And we have a general notion of annotation, which actually we do, but we have kind of a calculus of annotations of things. But I think that may have started life in audio annotate, which was a defensively designed thing because we knew there was a more general concept, but we weren't ready for it yet. And we knew we would get it wrong if we tried to do the design now, as opposed to five years later or something when we had more experience with it. And so, you know, it's things like that that help you achieve this kind of compatibility. But it's also this sort of chassis of transformation rules for symbolic expressions. I don't know whether it's good luck or good judgment, but it has worked and keeps on working. And it's an interesting thing. So I think about this a lot is how do we go beyond that, right? So this has been like, gosh, haven't you had a new idea in a hundred years of the development of mathematical logic? Don't we have a new idea yet? And it turns out, I will say that we do have a new idea. And actually, when you think about something like combinators or something like terminal writing systems, you're usually thinking about sort of tree structured expressions. And you're saying, how do I take this tree structured expression and rewrite pieces of it? Okay, what's the generalization of that? Okay, somewhat amusingly, the generalization is precisely what we've done in our physics project. The generalization is instead of rewriting trees, you're rewriting hypergraphs. And that's precisely what happens in our physics project. And so then the question is, can you make a programming system that's based on rewriting hypergraphs instead of rewriting trees? It turns out I tried to do that back in the 1980s. I was thinking about parallel computation. I tried to invent such a thing. I failed. And I've thought about it many times since. And here's where you run into trouble. The place you run into trouble is not in the mathematical definition of how to do things. The place where you run into trouble is us poor humans don't think very well in terms of transformations on hypergraphs. Just like you show somebody a big pile of combinators, SK combinators. It's like, what on earth is this? I mean, as I say, I just was looking at, because we're coming up to the centenary of combinators, I was looking at what have we not done that was in the idea of combinators? And the one thing we've not done is no variable names. So in other words, we have plenty of cases where we've got lambdas, but we typically have still names of variables. Now in Wolfram language, there's a hash sign, which represents a sort of anonymous, anonymous function. It's interesting. That's like a pronoun. If I say Jane chased Bob and she ran fast, okay? And we know what that means because we've got a pronoun that has a referent that goes to that thing. But if we say the dog chased the cat, it ran fast, it's like we lost it. We couldn't do that. And in Wolfram language, for example, that issue comes up as it does in lambdas, as it does in lambda calculus. You know, you've named the thing. In Wolfram language, we have these anonymous anonymous functions. So you have just has its hash sign. You can only use that one level, just like you can only use pronouns one level, so to speak. And similarly, if you have two X's on two nested lambdas, that doesn't work either. And the question is, can you get around that? And old Moses Schoenfinkel, interesting chap, I'm trying to track down his history. It's so little is known about him. He figured out a solution to that. He figured out that you could have the symbolic structure that essentially moves the data around and just specifies symbolically how you put this data into that argument position and so on. Unfortunately, when we as humans look at it, it's just frigging incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> and I can make these graphs. I try and make these representations of things. It's something that for whatever reason, at this time in history, at least, we don't seem to be able to wrap our heads around. And this sort of programming with hypergraphs thing, which I think is going to be part of the story of sort of distributed computing, of being able to understand how to do this kind of distributed computing thing. My best hope is that kind of using the language we get and the understanding we get from physics, we will be able to make some progress on that. What do you think the limitation is there? There's a limitation of our patterns of thinking. Can we make a hundred year plan, so to speak, where we gradually introduce people to more and more of these kinds of concepts to the point where in a hundred years, people will be able to program this way because that will have been a concept that has been introduced. People become familiar with it. Then you can keep building on it. And eventually, I don't think we'll all be writing SK combinators and you and I won't be around in a hundred years. Wolfram language has been around for 33 years, and my general direction of symbolic computational languages has been around for 40 years. That's a large fraction of the history. That's well more than half the history of all programming language of the time programming languages have been around. And it is interesting to me the extent to which how much things have and have not moved. I think to me, the thing that is both nice and frustrating 
is that these ideas are really the right ideas for a lot of kinds of things. The world isn't quite there yet. I mean, there are plenty of people who use Wolfram language and do these sort of magic things with it. But your average, I'm just going to write some random piece of code person isn't using it yet. And eventually they will, or they'll use some ripoff of it or something. But I don't know what those timescales are. And I was trying to think about it and I realized, oh my gosh, those timescales might be 50 years, 100 years. I don't know. I can see what the progress has been in 40 years. And there's been progress. You know, there's millions of people that use our language and things, including many people who do it in a very sophisticated way. But it's still shocking in a sense how little progress there's been in the kind of generic programming language idea. I mean, there's been a bunch of progress in understanding how to build large systems, but there is progress. But it's slow. It's on timescales of decades or quarter to half centuries and so on. I realized recently we had an annual technology conference and I talked about our technology stack and I was describing some of the things that we're doing as kind of artifacts from the future. And what I found amusing was a bunch of our users came up to me and said, you know what, that's a great description of what I do. You know, I'm in some field and I do these things. And it's like whenever things get really complicated, people come to me because I can do these things which in principle should be possible, but people just think that's impossible. That's something we can't do yet. But yet they're just, okay, it's a few lines of orphan language code, we can do it. Oh my gosh, that's a magic kind of thing that seems like an artifact from the future. Now, as a practical, as one leads one's life and runs one's company and so on, building artifacts from the future is not necessarily a great business strategy. For me, it's a very satisfying intellectual strategy for the people who understand what to do and sort of get that superpower of using it. It's a really worthwhile thing. I'm lucky that I built a company that's a private company, which is independent and doesn't really have to report quarterly earnings and so on. So we get to kind of think about things on a long-term basis, but we're building artifacts from the future is not one of those top IPO prospectus headlines, so to speak. (laughs) For sure. We are unfortunately getting awfully close to the end of our time, but I'd love to throw in one more quick question, if I may, which is you've recently started live streaming your language design sessions on Twitch, and I was interested as to why and what you got out of that. Right. I've done like 500 hours of those now, so I've got more than a toe in that particular water. The original reason was I just thought these discussions were really interesting, and I thought people will find these interesting. Why not share them? And what I discovered is that we get a lot of interesting people to kind of tune in and they make suggestions in real time. And the suggestions are pretty interesting. And there are a few features in our language now that were suggested by somebody on live stream. To my knowledge, this is just not something you can see anywhere else. I'd be curious. I'd be interested to see it, actually, because I don't know what other people's process is. And I think it also helps that what we do is pretty intellectual language design. Some parts of it are in the details of we're designing some crazy feature about cloud connectivity or something that's pretty in the weeds of software engineering. But a lot of it is, oh, we're designing something with how biological sequences should be represented. That's one recent thing. And that's something that ends up being just intellectually interesting. And I suppose for me, it probably feels a little bit more meaningful to be spending my time doing language design when it's live streamed than when it isn't. I had thought people would attack my ideas less if we were live streaming it, but it isn't true. (laughs) There's some people who would just viciously and vigorously attack things, which is as it should be. But nobody seems very inhibited by the live streaming aspect of it. And I think that it's been a terrific thing. Generally, we've been live streaming a decent fraction whenever it isn't just so freaking obscure that nobody's going to care. The things we don't live stream, we could, but we don't, is a lot of things to do with the progress of projects where it's like, we've got to this point, what's going to happen next and so on. People who are interested in project management might find that interesting. Those do involve sort of micro design decisions. And occasionally there are things where I'm like, I should have live streamed this. This would have been fun. Like I was totally frustrated. We have a very good DevOps team and so on, but there was some issue where our cloud is somehow down and I'm like, have you guys fixed this? Well, no, we can't figure it out. We're confused. We don't know what's happening. And it's like, okay, you know, let me see whether I can solve this. It's sort of bad CEO behavior at some level, although it turns out to be good CEO behavior in the end. And I'm like, okay, you know, let's get a Zoom session going. Let me see what's going on. Let's log into all these machines. Let's try and analyze what's happening. And actually, in the end, it was a wonderful example of using Wolfram language because it was some issue with an upstream internet provider passing some kinds of traffic to some peering providers and not to others and so on. And it was a great example. If you try and eyeball it, you don't solve the problem. But if you systematically take the data and you start making visualizations, 
violations and so on. Gosh, that's what's happening. Okay, call the ISP, tell them, go fix this thing. And it was fixed in another 10 minutes or something. I had no idea what the outcome would be in that case. But that was one where it's a shame we didn't live stream that one. That one would have been interesting because people would have been like, oh, you should try this, you should try that. But the process of live streaming design reviews, I think it's been very successful. And I think it's also fun for our users when they see features coming out in new versions. It's like, I saw that being designed. I had my chance to say that that was a bad idea. I didn't say it. Or also, another point is that people understand why we made certain decisions. And we are going to start linking. I think in the new version that's just about to come out, we'll be linking the actual design discussion to the documentation pages about different features. So people say, what were those guys thinking? This is just a dumb way to do it. They can go watch the three hours where that actually got designed. Stephen, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I could carry on talking to you for hours. This has been a fascinating conversation. So thank you so much for joining us this week on the InfoQ podcast.